Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. I'm getting ready for a class at my local library and I'm designing the project and I thought this might be kind of helpful because I know sometimes um, I'll have people on YouTube ask me, how would you go about doing a class for some beginners at the library? I think it's something once we get painting we want to share what we love. So I saw this photo on Unsplash and I thought this would be ideal because we've got, first of all, we've got a very basic rule of thirds, right? We've got a third is the sky and then two thirds would be the kind of the lake in the foreground. Um, there's some nice bright loop and flowers. This is going to be a class in April, so it'll be almost time for the flowers to start blooming here in Maine, and we have a lot of lupins, so people will like that. And um, also the rocks behind the lupins are a very bleached out gray, so I'll be able to keep the bottom half of the picture really light in order for me to be able to put the lupins in without doing any masking. So uh, we're going to go right ahead and I'm going to show you how I would go about this. Now this is going to be just as if I was teaching my group at the library, which are all very beginners. So when I'm doing a class of beginners, I want to do a project that I figure however long it takes me to do the project, um, I want it to be a third of the time. So if I'm doing an hour and a half class, I want it to be something I can paint in half an hour and that way I know it's going to work out pretty well for an hour and a half for my uh, my students. So we've got this uh, this bit of like shore coming over here. I think I might, I'll take it right off the, actually, you know what, maybe I won't take it all the way off the page. I'll kind of bring it in like that. We've got some land up here. I might be drawing a little bit darker than you probably would if you're not um, instructing, but if you are instructing, I would recommend um, that you have like a whiteboard or something where you can be really, you can go really dark. Like um, if there's a whiteboard at the library or you get a big pad of newsprint or something, you draw this with a marker so that people can really see what you're doing. This isn't gonna have a lot of difficult drawing. We've got some layers of mountains back here, or actually it's just kind of like landmass. And then we've got that shore kind of coming in. I'm just looking at the horizon line. No, actually I think that I think the horizon line is fine. I think I can leave that horizon line there. Lighten that up. I'm working on cotton paper and I am going to bring cotton paper in for my students to use. It's just going to be a small class. Um, I shouldn't have more than eight students, the librarian told me, so they're going to limit the, the class size for this one, so I can go a little bit bigger. Generally, I will teach on um, on greeting card sized projects because otherwise, when you have a bunch of beginners, it's really hard to get um, everyone through a project like that. So I'm going to lighten up my, my drawing now because that's a little bit too... It's a little too dark. This is just a couple needed, actually, there's a couple needed erasers. You don't need a couple, but I had a couple floating around, and I noticed they get kind of hard and unusable if you don't use them often, so that's why I took <laughs> I took them and just kind of put them together so they'll stay soft and supple. I don't keep them in anything, but it's probably not a bad idea to keep them in a little case if you've got something like that. All right, I'm going to start off with a large flat brush, and I'm going to get some cerulean blue. I'm also going to get a little bit of ultramarine blue, and I'm using my M-Gram watercolors, of course, you can use whatever you want. I'll actually be using my teaching set when I am, when I am uh, teaching my class, and we have uh, Aquafine watercolors in the teaching kit. And I'm going to start by wetting the sky. And what you want to do is get it so that you've got a nice sheen on the paper. Not puddly, but you want a nice sheen. And I'm actually going to you know, make sure it's really it's really worked into the paper. And I'm gonna just gonna kind of bring it down to the horizon. But if I don't have it fully wet to the horizon, it's not that big of a deal because I'll be painting the uh, the mountains on while the sky is still damp. I don't really want it too wet over the mountains. I want it a little bit damp so I have uh, some softness but not really wet. Now I'm going to take this mixture here. I'm going to add it to the top of the sky. Make sure you have a paper towel handy for blotting some clouds in a minute. But we're going to start off by adding the paint to the top. Okay, and then we're just going to go back and forth and gently bring it down. 
Now, if you need to add more color, whoops, <laughs> just want to soften that off there. If you need to add more color, you want to do it just over the top. You want to add color to the top and you want to work it down horizontally like we just did. That's going to give you a nice soft blend, a nice gradient. And I like to go right off the edge of the paper if I can and try not to work back up in it. If you're going to work back up into the sky, you want to do the whole thing again, right? You want to go right back from the beginning. Don't worry about that being a little darker there. So now I'm going to go in, I'm going to take my paper towel and I'm going to blot off some clouds at the edge and that's going to help give us a little bit of a framing effect. Now whether you add shading to the clouds or not, I think that really depends on the, the level of your students. If you're running tight on time, I would not bother putting shadow in the clouds. If you have time, if your students are a little bit more advanced, you definitely could do shadow. Shadows in the clouds. Go for random shapes though. You don't want them to be really, you know, you don't want them to look like you just did this with a paper towel. You want it to look a little bit more random, so I just re-bunch my paper towel up and, uh, and get some different shapes going. Okay, before it completely dries, you can switch to a smaller flat brush if you want to, but I'm going to stick with that same color. Uh, that same ultramarine blue and, and cerulean, I'm going to take a little bit of burnt sienna, I'm going to mix into that. kind of a bluish gray color and I am going to go in and paint these far away mountains and I'm not going to worry about them being fuzzy because you want those far away mountains to be kind of fuzzy it's gonna help push them off into the distance so I'm, I am just painting down to that that uh, I have a couple different layers of mountains or, or land, I should say. So I'm just doing the far away ones. Okay. I might switch to a smaller flat or a smaller angle, whatever you have is fine. Make it go a little bit darker, a little bit more of the ultramarine blue, a little bit more of the burnt sienna. I want a little bit darker of a color, but I don't need it too, I don't want it too watery, too runny. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of like dab it a little bit, dab the belly of the brush on a paper towel. And then I can go in and just add some little darker values if I want to, little shadows. And this little detail here is something you can omit if you are running short on time. You can get a good feel, uh, I think, pretty early on in the class. If you've got a lot of people kind of chit-chatting, coming in late, that sort of thing, you may need to um, omit some steps. And it, it's kind of a bummer if you have some people chit-chatting and coming in late and other people that aren't. Um, because you kind of have to, you do kind of have to tailor your class to the middle to the slower ones, unfortunately. Um, I'm getting some yellow ochre and I'm also going to get some either sap green or hooker's green, whichever one you have on your palette. And I already have a little bit of blue in here and I'm just going to add that into this area where we've got that other layer of, of ground. And it's okay if it gets a little fuzzy where it meets up with the um, 
with the other mountains because that will just give us like treetop type fuzz. I'm going to grab a little bit of um, a little sap green, a little bit of that cerulean blue. Darken it a little bit and add a little bit of that in here and there. And you could also say if you were, if you had a very uh, vast difference in ability levels, you could, you could say if you're more advanced and you want to add to it you can but you don't have to. That's something I'll do sometimes if if I have a, a variety of students and I know I know some people are going to be completely bored if they have to wait around for the other students and I know some people are going to be completely um, lost just by, just by bearing, bearing that, giving them a, a variation of okay if you want to go on and do something a little bit more in depth do this, if not just do it one that one green color. Uh, I'm going to bring the ground up a little bit higher over here. I don't like how there's a couple mountains. Oh, I can show you here. I don't like how that shape and that shape right there over like line up. I don't think that looks as good as if it was as if the green came up a little bit higher. So I'm going to make my green come up a little bit higher there. So I don't have that tangent running. Break up the tangent. It looks a lot nicer. I painted my papers drying so quickly. I've got my radiator on today, um, as I do often. I'm going to bring the. Uh, Boy, this brush, which one is this one? Is this one? I was just thinking, is this my Alvin that I got when I was like a little child because the uh, bristles are pulling apart on me? I think this might be a Royal Nine Nickel. But anyway, that I have an old, uh, I have an old brush by Alvin. It was like the first watercolor brush I ever had, and I still have it somewhere in my stash. I think it's in my in one of my travel. One of my, my old class travel box. But anyway, they do last you a long time if you take care of them, especially a tap on. Okay. All right, we've got some nice depth there. I'm happy with that. I'm going to, I want to mix up kind of like a gray color. I'm just going to go ahead with a burnt sienna and ultramarine blue and a lot of water. Maybe I will throw a little of that cerulean in there too. I love a big mixing area. All right, I'm just gonna kind of dance it in front of my land here. Can leave a little bit of a gap of white. But I wanna bring it around. I haven't wet my paper where this is going. I think, I'm, I think I'm gonna switch to a bigger brush actually. And I think a little wet coming in through here just so I can I won't have a harsh a harsh line where I'm gonna be having the um, oops I got a little drip in there, getting some blossoms. That's not the end of the world. I want this really light where I'm gonna end up having um, the flowers and I and I don't want to have any harsh edges from where the the, uh, the ground is going to be. I just want to keep it really light. I like the look of that. I think that's almost looks like a it looks like it could be a little pond or something. And then maybe a little yellow ochre into this mix to warm it up in some spaces. This could end up being little rocks in the water. Just 
just don't want it completely stark. And then something I think that I could put in now that would be handy would be tapping in just a little bit of dioxazine violet for some lupin. I'm just using the corner of my brush. Very, very, I'm doing right into the wet. Right into the wet uh, paper. Just some little groupings of far away, not really that far away, but uh, uh, far enough away that they're out of focus. Flowers, and I'm going to take the other corner of my brush, pick up some sap green. I'm just tap in a little bit of sap green area too, but I don't want I don't want too much here. This is just setting the scene. All right, we are doing pretty well. I'm at 16 minutes already. Sometimes I'll find a point, a breaking point where I'll, a breaking point, that doesn't sound good. Sometimes I'll find a point where I could tell my students that it's time we could take a little break. And that that's nice because it can give students a chance to catch up. I'm actually gonna go in with a round brush and my dioxazine violet and make some little lines because lupins are very, very pointy. I don't know if I, they're very pointy flowers. I feel like they just need a little bit more structure because they're not that far away, but they are enough to be out of focus. There. Maybe a little bit more of the sap green. You can add a little blue to that if you want to, but up to you. I'm not going to do too much of that though because I've got some brighter colors and need to work in there. And if you at home are having a hard time uh, keeping up, that after you get these little fuzzy guys in, it'd be a great time to take a little break. And I think uh, that's what I'm going to do. Let this dry and then we'll come back and finish it up. All right, this is fairly dry. It's absolutely not perfectly dry, but it's going to be fine. So what we're going to do here is we're going to paint the water. So the water is going to reflect the sky. It's also going to reflect the green and uh, green land area and the um, a little bit of the gray area uh, in the clouds. So it doesn't have to be a perfect reflection, like a mirror or anything, but we want to keep that in mind. So we want to get out our sky color. We had ultramarine blue and we had cerulean. You don't have to use such a big brush. You can use anywhere of a, a um, half inch or larger brush for this. I like to use a flat just because it's easy to keep the um, it's easy to keep my ripples. I mean, it's going to be pretty smooth, but it's easy to keep your ripples a little more horizontal. I also want to have a little bit of the green color there. I think I needed a little bit more yellow ochre in there for our green. And then we get to clean up our mat too, which is nice. Our, our uh, clean up our mess a little bit. I think I need a little bit more of the grayish color. Okay, you could pre-wet the water, uh, the water area. I really don't think it's necessary and that way we can really see where we're going in. I'm gonna start with the I'm going to start with the blue. I'm going to clean my brush off. Blot the excess water off. You don't want it super dry though because um, the paper is dry and you will need a, the vehicle to make it move around a little bit. But I'm going to go in. I like to leave a little bit of glimmer at the uh, where the water and the ground meet. It also will help if you're um, if you're paper is not perfectly dry so you don't have bleeding. Now I'm going to grab my green. I'm going to add that in on the edges where I have the green because it's going to reflect what's next to it, right? Uh, up here, the green. And I like to have it on my palette because if it's on my palette ready to go then I shouldn't have issues. 
grab some more of the blue. And grab some of that gray. And a little bit of the gray. Well, not too much of the gray over here, actually. I don't know how much that the gray would be reflecting. I'm going to go with some clear water for the clouds. Just, just kind of keep that brush moving so you don't get back runs. And I can bring that white, that clear, right into our, our rocky area. Now we're kind of getting a little bit of a fuzz from the like from our the water the paint wine to back run a little bit so I'm gonna go in a little bit more blue try to temper that but don't worry about any blossoms because the blossoms will just look like the clouds are being reflected and that's fine but if you find that you're getting back runs because your paper is not drying equally then you just kind of go back in uh, re-wet everything but I think that looks pretty good um, and I would try not to fuss with it honestly because fussing with it rarely makes it better now something that is a nice way to get a little texture and especially if you've got some rocky areas is a spattering with like a toothbrush. I've got a toothbrush right here. I prefer to use an old toothbrush. So, you know, if you've got um, your toothbrushes kicking around, I just, you know, you can soak them in some bleach water, toss them in the dishwasher, you know, get them clean. I don't, I have no problem recycling toothbrushes for art, but I do clean them. Um, you know, recycle them for cleaning too. It's like... I don't know, I don't think we need to be throwing something away we can use, right? Alright, so I'm making my grayish color here. I like to take like a, um, I like to use something as a mask. Honestly, I just threw away a bunch of planner pages. Uh, actually, this is, I'll make myself a little mask. Basically, I like to take a piece of torn paper and I'll just kind of hold it in the air. I think I might want it a little bit juicier actually. So I can have some bigger spatters. And that will represent kind of rocks in the distance. Can go like that. It's subtle. And that's exactly what I want. I just want some subtlety. And I'm gonna just randomly spray over here so we have a little bit of a of a background for our lupin and yeah look at the depth we have here I mean that's a lot of depth I think that looks really nice um, so before we paint the lupin we're gonna want to make sure everything's dry I'm just gonna hit it really quick with my heat tool and that's gonna make it so that when we go if we paint some of the taller lupins in here and they go over the water where it's wet we're not gonna have those those back runs so you want to do that um, I don't know if I'm going to put any shadows on the clouds. I'm going to see how it looks when I'm all done, but I can always go back up in there with some of that gray color, and that would be great for my cloud shadows. So don't clear off your palette until you're done your painting. But I do recommend cleaning your palette off when you're done your painting. Obviously, leave the paint in the wells on the side, but your mixing area. Clean that off when you're done. It's uh, it's the only thing it's going to do is it's going to make your next painting muddy, unless you use the exact same colors for your next painting. So. Um, I see that. That's a pet peeve of mine. Uh, I see that all the time. I'll see people's dirty palettes, like, and I've left a palette dirty before, so I'm certainly not perfect, but going into the next painting when your palette's dirty, I don't think that's a, a great idea. So I'm going to start off with my lightest color, and I'm going to use a nice, big, round, juicy brush. It doesn't have to be too big. I would say uh, somewhere in the 8 to 12 size. This looks like a 10. It's an 8. I'm going to take um, some dioxazine violet because we've already used that and I'm going to add some water to it and I'm going to add a little ultramarine blue to it. Ooh, that's a little too much ultramarine blue so let's go with a little bit more water and purple and um, our lupins that actually almost seems a little bit darker than what I want. I'm gonna add a little bit more water. Lupins will range from white to purple to pink. And 
I'm getting these really light ones. I'm not going to have white, white, but like this is this will be my lightest, my lightest color. Now I think I'll put in a little bit more color and just kind of let it float in there. I'm not using any like specialty granulating colors. You could though. This might be a pretty place to have like a, a little, to use some like cobalt violet or something like that here and there. So they, they're spike shaped flowers. I'm gonna take some, um, do some like Quin Rose or Quin Magenta, whatever color you have on your palette that's kind of a pinkish red. It doesn't have to be the same exact color. Actually, I think maybe I'll add some of that into that one because that, You want to think of space, you're going to want to have room to put some of the other flowers. I like how the colors run together. I make them more conical than probably they really they really should be, but um, let's do, I want to do a couple big scale ones right off the bottom of my paper right now. I want to make sure that um, I'm keeping that scale. I'm going to grab a little bit of brown and just throw in, um, I don't want to go too high. I kind of, well, I kind of do because I love those really dramatic ones, but I'm going to put one here and let's see how that looks. I'm going to go a little bit, mm, you know, I'll start off with a mix here, but I'm going to, I'm going to drop in some, some more colors. So I want a lot of these little petals to, to touch so that I will get that Let that bleeding now the way the petals are organized on a loop and they're kind of they kind of go around almost like a spiral staircase except they don't instead of spiraling they're kind of like floors I guess more like levels on a on a floor rather than a spiral but I want to go just kind of go in and I love to see colors blend together so I'm adding the color towards the bottom of these petals that I just painted Dioxin violet is really strong, so be careful with it. It's really bright. But since I'm using Aquafine paints for the class, I think I don't think we'll get in trouble as far as it being too much for my students to handle. So I like that. So we've got that one for scale. Let's put a pink one. Let's put a pink one over here. Again, let's start with a watered down version of the color. Uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. You're generally going to see about three blossoms on one side of the flower. I'm going to go in with the darker paint right off the pans. Let me do a pink one over here as well, but I think I will put in, I'm going to grab a liner brush for my stem. I haven't put any greenery in yet. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit higher. I don't want it to line up with that though. with a watery down watery down color to begin the taps are smaller at the top because those blossoms haven't opened up yet they're smaller little buds I don't know why that is but it seems to be how it goes I'm using arches cold press Maybe 
maybe I'll do them more on one side, do the color more on one side on this one. So vary it a bit. I also think I will throw in just a little bit of spatter for a little bit of liveliness. I love how the colors are bleeding together there. You gotta be careful what you put in the dead center. You want to make sure that you're not going to be um, doing anything that like splits the paper in half or makes your eye get like stuck there in the center. So I think I'll probably do a it's kind of like a little a little shorty here. I'll do a little, maybe I'll do a taller one there and have it work into those spatters. I'll do one half off the page there. I'm going slow because I don't want to, um, I don't want to have anything too drastic. Let's do one that's more blue. Let's take a little ultramarine blue. Really watery though. We'll do, we'll do the light blue one over here. Oh, that's, you know what, let's get some cerulean blue. We've used that for the sky, that's gonna be fine. Why did I start at the bottom? I prefer to start at the top for these flowers. I don't know why exactly, but I think it looks better, I guess. So I'll do a little ultramarine and cerulean for the shadow color. Cerulean is a little bit more of a green undertone. Both of those colors granulate, so they might give us some pretty effects. So the blossoms at the top. Oh, I'll start at the top. We'll do it right over here. We'll start it up on, the, it doesn't have to be started by the top, but I'm just thinking that just seems so much more natural. One, two, three. I like how it's into those splashes. It makes it, it really helps if you can um, really plan out your painting like this. I mean, it's not like we spent a ton of time taking the dioxazine violet and the ultramarine blue to make a more cooler purple here. Um, it's not like we need to you know, take a ton of time, but just being a little intentional when you start a painting can keep you from being like, oh, that's real simple. Cause that happens to me sometimes. I'm like, oh, I just want to paint something really simple. I want to put out a, an easy tutorial for people, or a, I just want to create an easy project for people. And then I end up just kind of going the cliche route and painting like the same things I always paint. And then I'm not happy with it um, because it looks cliche. And if I just took a little bit more time I think I want to add, do I want to add a different pink in there? I'm thinking I might want a little bit of this Quinn Red. I don't know, do I want to bring some? Yeah, I do. I'm going to add it with the other, the Quinn Rose. I want something a little bit more, a little bit warmer. Um, but by doing that, by putting that more intention in it and finding out, like, I, for me, to be excited about a painting, I have to find out, okay, what's going to, What's, what do I love about this? What's going to make me happy to paint it? What's going to keep me interested for the duration of this lesson, for the duration of this painting? Because if I can't remain interested in it, how am I supposed to expect someone else to, you know? This one I don't think I'll bring it to the bottom of the paper. I'm going to want to be able to nestle some of these into... Um, into the, the mid-ground. You know, gotta think, you know, you gotta think about that, like, as an instructor. Are you, are you interested in this? Because if you're not interested in it, why would they be interested in it? Why would your students be interested in it? I mean, maybe nobody on YouTube is going to be interested in this, because, you know, you're not from Maine, you might not really, like, why would I paint, why would I want to paint lupins? Um, it's a very Maine subject. I'm going to fade the bottom of that out. Just take a wet brush and just kind of fade it like that. You know? Um, so 
I want to find something in this that I think would be would be appealing to people even if you're not from Maine. So, you know, make sure there's depth, make sure there's design, make sure there's something there that um, will attract others. So the we will want to add a little more detail to these foreground flowers because that's going to give us the depth as well. Oh, uh, and you can go more with like your favorite color. If you've got a color that maybe you prefer the blue, the blue lupins, maybe you prefer the pink ones. I'm going to go with a lighter color here because I don't want anybody's eyes to get stuck in the center. Oh, I got a little, I might have to scrub out some of that. Um, that stem's a little aggressive there. I also want it to be very floaty and I don't feel like I captured that effect very well. I feel like it's very harsh. These flowers are a little harsh. They are kind of harsh. Not harsh shape, but they have these tight little feathers, not floppy or anything, I guess I should say. So I'm just going to take the scrubber. Uh, this is a soft scrubber by Royal and Langnickel. They have these in their nocturnal line and in their Menta line, and in their Zen All Media line. So I just gotta figure, I got one more flower there that I wanna paint, but then after that I've gotta I've gotta decide. Um, am I done with the flowers? Because I'm gonna have to start putting in putting in my greenery. Once you get that green in there though, it's gonna be tough to get more flowers in, so. I'll fade out the bottom a bit. Going with some brighter pink. I also don't want this to be an intimidating project either. I want people to see this and be like, oh yes, I can do that. That's gonna be fun. I don't want anyone to feel like that's that's intimidating. I can't I can't do that. So it's a lot to balance. Put some of these just little tappy ones in. So they're going to be bigger than these little fuzzy ones that we did, but not as big as some of the others. Do a few over here too. All right, uh, let's see. Do I want some more? That is the question. I'm not actually gonna pop this up on the easel for a second, look at it, have a little think, and then when we come back, we'll put in our last few flowers, we'll add the details, and uh, our bladder greenery, and that will be it. All right, I took a little break, and I was not that thrilled with it as I was leaving, but, um, <sighs> But now I have, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit better about it. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, a little bit of loosening up with some spatter and then I'm going to do a little tightening up with some detail. Um, I'm going to start by spattering little bits of green. I don't know how effective this is going to be, but I need to get something. I feel like I just need to get something in there. Um, maybe a little bit, oh, I haven't used any like bright yellow, I'm gonna use some Cad Lemon. I love that yellow, I know some people don't like to use cadmiums, in that case use Hansa Yellow Light. Okay, I'm not loving that. Um, let me try, let me try pulling some little Try turning some of those spatters into some little foliage, I guess. Oftentimes you have the lupins will be kind of in like grassy fields. The lupin fl uh, flowers themselves or leaves themselves are very, um, 
they're kind of a star shaped kind of like um if you've ever seen a i'm sure you have if you're if you live in if you live in a state where they've legalized marijuana you've seen the shape of a marijuana leaf um that's kind of how the the leaves on lupin are when you when you see the actual leaves i want to throw in a few dark patches But I want them to also kind of fade out into some brighter areas. I guess I'm not, I want there to be a looseness to it, but I also feel like I don't have enough dark value in this painting. Taking the ultramarine blue and mixing it with a sap green will give me a desaturated darker green, which I think works kind of well in these situations. Anywhere we've got like kind of the packed Got some packed flowers. I don't want to, I don't know, I'm kind of like, part of me thinks like I maybe should have more flowers there, but I also want to leave it kind of open. I want there to be a little bit of a lightness. I'm kind of gingerly approaching this. I'll be, I would be able to paint this faster the second time I did it. But, um, but this stage where I haven't painted this before, I'm a little slow. But that's alright because I have to like account for How my students will probably be. Well, this is this. These will be just like grasses in the field. Holding my brush at the end so I get a real loose stroke. Gently coming out, building out from the flowers. See what I what I want exactly. You know what I think I will do though. I'm just going to spray that area. So when I do add color in there, it's going to go, it's going to go loose. I'm going to go with a smaller brush too. I just feel like it's getting too dark. And then maybe now that I have some wet area, I can flick into it and it will work a little bit more like I want. Because I think that if I'm going to paint the specific um, the lupin leaves, I would like to overlay them in a, maybe a more... Uh, like an, in an area like that. <sighs> That's a big green space, but I think once I get some darker leaves on top, it'll be fine. Put a little spray there. The bright colors I have are fairly staining, so. So they shouldn't move too much. I'm gonna get some of those other colors spattered in there. Oops, got the wrong red. I think this is just feeling a little too tight and predictable. Sometimes you just gotta take a break from a painting when you're not feeling it. Boy, that uh 
That doxazine violet is overpowering at times. I'm hoping that, let me go with a smaller brush. I'm hoping that um, as I go in and detail, I will be able to um, get, pull a little bit, sorry for the noise there, pull a little bit of, um, I don't know, get a little bit of punch maybe. I'm going to actually zoom in on one of my lupin flowers just so I can see what. I've got going on there. And bring a little structure into these guys. I think I'll wait to do the rest of that until I get a little bit more. A little bit drier. Oh, actually, do I want to blot? I think I want to blot some of that up there on the bottom. You know what? I'm just going to dry this and we'll come back after the water pump is quiet. All right, we got some lovely quiet <laughs> again. Um, and I've dried my paper, so all good things, right? All good things. Okay, so we are going to put a little bit more structure in detail in the lupins here. Gosh, I'm not, I'm not really happy with this picture. I've got to be honest with you. I'm kind of bummed. I, w I had really high hopes with the depth that we had in the first few layers. And now I'm like, oh man, I'm not loving it. But we'll see how it turns out. Sometimes you just got to distance yourself from it a bit. And oftentimes it's stuff that, the stuff that ends up being popular with students and it's not necessarily the same stuff that um that is something that I think is going to be popular you know sometimes the stuff that people really want to create or not isn't what um you think it's going to be as a as an instructor I get to say that for sure as a youtuber because pro uh, projects that I've done that have done really well are like a complete shock to me I'm not going too crazy on the detail because I'm only going to have an hour and a half with my students at the library. They will be working probably, this is 9 by 12, I think I'll be giving them papers a little bit, probably about half the size, so that will also make it a little bit more manageable for them to finish in the hour, but I'm going to give them cotton paper and um, that should give them really good, really good outcomes. You know what, I think I'm just going to use a small brush for the tops of my flowers. I think I'm going to switch to a larger brush. I'm even thinking about bringing in some gouache. I don't know. We are, <laughs> we're struggling. I'm struggling. I don't know about you. You know, it, it, it's not what I, it's really just too stiff. I think that's the thing. When I was envisioning this project uh, in my mind's eye, I definitely had something a lot looser and more ethereal, but um, Maybe because I was trying to film it and narrate it at the same time, I ended up going very literal, very literal, and to me it's kind of looking cliche, and I don't know. I'm not super duper happy with it. But if my students are happy with it, if they want to take the class, then that's all that matters. We're all on different points of the journey. I might like it tomorrow when I see it. You know, I hope I do. Take a little bit of this other pink. I think this actually is helping a bit, having that really loose blurry, uh, blurry green is making this work a little bit better. So that's good at least. I was kind of like, eh, I think I'm only going to detail these guys in the front row. That will hopefully keep it from getting too tight and overworked. I don't think it's overworked, but sometimes it's like, well, if I want to do this style, it needs to have more detail than what I'm doing. 
Well, I want to detail this guy too because that's kind of standing up like it could be. I'm not going to put as much. Alright, I'm going to go to a larger brush. And well, maybe not that large. We'll go to a number five, I think. And let's take some of our blues. If you've never worked with a large palette, if you've got the room for it, I, I recommend it. The The metal tins, those are not like the normal thing for studio palettes. I feel like they're, they become very popular now because of YouTube and because there's so many, you know, tempting little sets that have come out. That needs to be a little bit more on the violet end, I think. Um... But I mean, generally, what we would all do is we would get a big palette like this and we would just add colors as we either needed for our classes or we'd add colors just as a curiosity got peaked. And um, yeah, went from went from there. But generally, that would be more than I mean, it is more than enough colors. It would be, you know, plenty. Ah, here we go. I feel like this is where I want to be. This is feeling a little bit better. Let's use up that purple. And if people don't like this powder, they don't have to do it. But I feel... I like that. I think that's... Oh, that looks better. I'm looking up at my monitor. I think that looks better. All right, so now for our little... Our little pot leaf flowers. That's what they're shaped like. I'm sorry. That's what lupin leaves are shaped like. And I try to communicate any universal language. So you almost got like a little, uh, they're like these little, and that's important to know because if you like, Maybe you're maybe you've moved to Maine and you're looking around your flower flower bed and you're wondering if those little star leaves are um, are weeds or weed or something you want to keep. They're they're lupins. That's what they are. So now you know. So that way you don't you don't pick you know you don't weed them out you don't pick them out by accident. I don't like that. That's a little too literal. I'm gonna. I am not. I'm not loving the greenery. I I need to just. I don't know. I don't know what I need to do. Maybe some more spatter. When in doubt. More spatter works pretty good. <laughs> This, this um, brush has really long hairs for how wide it is, so it's a little bit more difficult to control. So just kind of keep that in mind. If you've got a brush like that and you're like, oh, I cannot get my, uh, my strokes the way that I want them, if you go with a brush like those, that's really long. If you went with a brush with like three quarters of that length, it would be so much easier to handle. I'm just tucking in little little leaves. I'm not going to try to do little stars because for one, I think it really looks like marijuana and uh, I don't want my library ladies to <laughs> get upset. I don't know if they would. They probably wouldn't. It's illegal here. Uh, I'm just tucking in here and there. I don't feel like I want that much. That much white space in the flowers, but I am going to throw in some kind of calligraphy. These are this brush right here is it's because of the long bristles. It's so nice for loose. Like uh, grassy strokes. 
there. I actually think adding those grassy strokes in help temper those little those little short leaves that the lupin have. We have just oh this is a great little place I like to kayak and there are just fields and fields of these beautiful lupins in June. So nice. Okay, so now I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, I'm I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I'm thinking I would like to shadow the clouds though a little bit because um, especially up higher, um, I don't know, I'm just not that thrilled with. I don't know, the level of detail in this maybe. I think maybe if I get a little, do something with the clouds, that will help. And so I'm going to put, I'm going to turn this upside down or sideways or something so I can kind of define. And I'm going to have a, a clean brush, which I will blend with. That's probably a little too dark. Or something you can do is you can wet the cloud and then add in your shadow. You just want to avoid the harsh edges. I'm turning it upside down. I just find it a little bit easier to, you know, here I've got that. I've got some pink up there. Actually, I could probably just scrub it out. Oh, wow. Scrubbing out all right. Maybe I will add just a little bit of shadow. This two brush method where you have a clean brush for blending and a um, and a brush with paint on it for painting is is handy, I think. Oh shoot. Unless you drop water on the paper, then that's not as handy. Your clouds are smaller towards the horizon because they're further away from the viewer. It's a little bit of a leap of faith when you do this because you're putting in, uh, you're putting them in upside down. So it's kind of hard to tell how they're going to look until you flip it over again. I might need to lighten up some areas, but that'll be fine because uh, I can use my scrubber for that. And the colors I used in the sky are very, um, are very sedimentary, so they don't stain the paper too bad. I think I, I think it's nice actually to wet the paper a little bit first. I'm going right in over that paint. I need to soften up that edge a little bit, so I will need to clean off that brush before I use it to blend again. Somehow, both of my brushes, both of my buckets of water have ended up to be dirty. <laughs> shape of that. All right, let's turn it around and see how she looks. Oh, I like that. I think that looks better. Well, I think uh, you know what, maybe a little bit more detail over on that 
flower and some violet. Painting some of those individual little petals there. And I mean, it might not hurt to put in some highlights with some white gouache on the um, on the flowers. My palettes do have white in them, so that's definitely something my students could do if they needed to. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I want to do white. I do have my bleed proof white here. Bleed proof white is a nice option because it. Uh, it works well. I just want to make sure I have a stiffer brush to apply it with. This one will work pretty well. It's a, it's a, um, actually, no, I'm going to scoop some out and put it on my palette because my water is, my rinse water is looking pretty grimy, so I don't want to get grimy water. That's Dr. Peach Martin's Bleed Proof White. Give it a little spray in my palette. Let's see. I may have diluted that a little too much. You know what? Maybe even just like, sometimes just flicking some. Oh, that's too big of a brush. It's getting way too much color down. I have so many brushes on my table right now. It looks really opaque and bright, but I did add water to it, so it's not going to be this this intense. And if you add water to it, um, the colors underneath can mix in with it and bleach through. Whereas if you don't, then it's going to be more bleed proof. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind. If you do add, if you do thin it down. You're gonna lose a little bit of the bleed proof qualities. I don't know if I like this, honestly. I think I might have liked it better before. I think I'm making rash decisions. Boy, you're getting all the behind the scenes of how to design, what it's like to design a project and uh, the doubt and everything that goes in with it. You know, sometimes you have to take some uh, shortcuts but you have to find some time savers and some things that will save a project mm, I don't know I think I like it all right I think it's gonna work you can let me know what you think in the comments below please be nice uh, <laughs> I think it's all right. I gotta, I'll have to let it sit on my easel and see what I think later, but I think I'm gonna call it done. I mean, feel free to tweak as much as you like. I think that, uh, I think that's very main looking and I think my students will enjoy it. And I hope you enjoyed it too. I hope you painted along and uh, had a good time. And until next time, happy crafting. Bye.